please hit subscribe. Hello. There were some questions about the possible topics that could be covered in the exams. And here I talk about what I think may be useful to remember when taking the Mathematics B exam. So this is the Mathematics for Natural Sciences. So for Mathematics B, I think I can classify the topics according to these five categories. General Mathematics, Trigonometry, Geometry and Analytic Geometry, Probability and Calculus. So I noticed that usually at the end of the paper there will, there will be some calculus problems and at the beginning there will be some general mathematics questions and so I want to talk about these in this order. For the general mathematics section I noticed that logarithms are a staple in the maths questionnaire and in particular for example in the 2020 paper the first question could be solved by knowing this identity here that the log of q base p is equal to the quotient of log p over log q and so it might be helpful to remember this identity and in particular the properties of logarithms that's really going to help also i noticed that there were a substantial there was a substantial amount of problems that involved the manipulation of functions and of course the manipulation would include factoring and quadratic formula and the related uh, techniques so please recall the quadratic formula that's really going to help you find the roots and you will see that this is this this is uh, employed in the previous papers as well and one of the other things that i i think is always always in the papers is parabola the parabola in standard form because this allows you to compute the maximum and the minimum values of a quadratic function so it's always useful to be able to take a quadratic function or a quadratic expression and put it in this form this is the standard form of a parabola so you have one variable here minus some constant and then you square it plus some constant here and this constant is either your minimum or your maximum and this h here is where that minimum or maximum occurs and the plus or minus here indicates whether you have a maximum or a minimum so if you have a plus you have a minimum because your parabola is opening upwards and if you have a minus you have a maximum because your parabola is opening downwards and a here is just a constant so if you look at the papers the past papers there will always be problems involving maximum and minimum and the the usual technique that we that we employ would be the parabola and this standard form here so i think it's really helpful if if we master manipulating this standard form another common problem in the paper is the remainder theorem so a problem that involves the remainder theorem is quite common in the papers and basically what it says is that if if you have a polynomial f of x and you know that g of x is a factor and you know that a is a root of g of x then f of a equals r of a so basically you just replace x with a so there and because you know that g of a goes to zero because well a is a root then you see f of a equals r of a using this in a problem could be challenging if you're not used to it so i suggest you do a lot of problems that involve the remainder theorem and then there is also a lot of inequalities so they test your ability to manipulate inequalities and one of the things that people often forget is that in an inequality if you have a negative number if you multiply the both sides of the inequality by a negative number the inequality must flip and many people forget that so that's very important another is prime factorization so maybe it's a good idea to to familiarize ourselves with the factors of of the usual numbers 
also the usual powers of 2 up to 2 to the 10. So 2 to the 10 is 1024. 2 to the 11 is uh, 2048 and so on. So 4096 for 2 to the 12. So all these powers of 2 sometimes come in handy. So it might be useful to get familiar with them. Also, I saw some problems on mathematical induction, in particular, I think that was in the 2019 paper. So it might be useful to review on that. And then some complex number problems. It might be helpful to remember Euler's formula. So this equation here, where you have e raised to the i times theta is equal to actually cosine of theta plus i sine theta. So this is very neat because this relates an exponential function with the trigonometric functions. And it might often be easier to manipulate the e rather than the rather than the trigonometric functions. Sometimes it also comes in handy to remember the geometric series. So this is for the ge general geometric series. If you have a sequence with the common difference r, then your sum, the sum from the first to the nth number is just this. There were also many trigonometry questions and it's very useful to remember the sum and difference identities of sine and cosine, the Pythagorean identity identities. So for example, sine squared of theta plus cosine squared of theta equals one and the related identities there. Also the half angle identities and the double angle identities come in handy. And it might be useful to remember the sine law. So they will have problems on triangles. So what this says is that if you have a triangle and if you label them such that the angle A is opposite the side A, the angle B opposite the side B, the angle C opposite the side C, then you have this relationship. And related to that is the cosine law. Again, if you label them in the same manner here, then you see this relationship. Also, if you notice from the cosine law, if the angle is 90 degrees, if the angle in C, in, across C, opposite C is 90 degrees, then cosine of 90 is zero. So this term vanishes and we're left with the Pythagorean theorem that is consistent with the theorem that says that a, a triangle is right if and only if the sum of the squares of the sides is equal to the, to the square of the hypotenuse. For the geometry and analytic geometry problems, I noticed that there was substantial use of the triangle inequality. This is the inequality that should hold in any triangle. It says that any side of a triangle must be less than the sum of the two other sides. So this is true for any triangle. So if this is not true, then you do not have a triangle. Then we also have the angle between intersecting lines. So if the if the angle that line, suppose we have line one and line two, if line one makes an angle of theta one with the positive x axis, and line two makes an angle theta two with the positive x axis, then the sum of this angle, the tangent of the sum of their angle, meaning that's the angle between the two lines, is equal to this quantity. Here, m sub one is the slope of line one and m sub two is the slope of line two. Then we also have to remember the special angles. And that is to say that we have to remember that sine of 30 is equal to the cosine of 60. And that's one half. And the sine of 60 is equal to the cosine of 30 and that's square root of three over two. And of course, the sine and the cosine of 45 degrees is equal to one over square root of two. Then there are, all, there are also some problems involving tangent to curves. We just have to remember that the equation of a line is this. And sometimes we might need to deal with vectors. 
and one useful one useful theorem is that two vectors are perpendicular to each other if and only if the dot product of the vector so you have vector a and vector b if their dot product is equal to zero for the probability questions i classify them i classify the useful ideas into counting techniques and the concept of conditional probability so for counting techniques we have permutations and combinations so permutations is when you are counting the number of ways you can arrange the items combinations doesn't care about the order doesn't care about the arrangement it's just combining items and so for example if you have three items you a b and c for a permutation, A, B, C is different from C, B, A. But for the combination, they are the same because for the combination, they don't care. It doesn't care about the order. It just cares about the, the, the members of a combination, what elements go into the combination. And so if you're counting the number of permutations, that is the number of arrangements, different arrangements, of a set of items let's say you have n items and they're all different then there are n factorial permutations but if for example you have two a's and one b so you still have three items so to count the number of permutations you have to to do the n factorial but you have to divide it by how many of the items are repeating so k here is the number of items that that is repeated so for example, if you have A, A, B, if you flip the two A's, it's still A, A, B. So you have to, to divide this by two factorial. So three factorial divided by two factorial would be the number of permutations if your items in the collection are A, A, and B. For combinations, that is just N factorial over R factorial, where R so here n again is the number of items you have in the collection and r is how many of them are you taking at a time so if you're taking two items out of three items and you're taking two items at a time you're combining two items at a time then you have here three factorial over two factorial times three minus two factorial then we also remember the idea of conditional probability the conditional probability is usually written like this what this means is that if you know if you know in advance that the the condition satisfied is b you have a condition b and it is satisfied the probability that it is also a is the probability that a and b that that a and b are both satisfied over the probability that b is satisfied so again the meaning of this is that this is the probability that a is satisfied if you already know that b is satisfied here in the numerator this is the probability that both a and b are satisfied and here in the denominator this is the probability that b is satisfied so you can you can have a look at problem two of the 2020 exam and you will see an application of this of this conditional probability and lastly i noticed that at the end of the math papers there's usually a calculus question a few calculus questions and the calculus that is usually asked is about derivatives so the usual dy dx and sometimes they give it in terms of parametric curves and so you must be able to know how to get the, the derivative if you're given the parametric curves the parametric equations and then they usually ask about the area under the curves and we just recall that it is the definite integral of f of x from the limits a to b and they also ask sometimes about the volume when you revolve the curve around 
when you revolve the area under the curve around some axis. So there you go. I think those are the usual topics covered in the exam. And just make sure that you're familiar with them. And if you're already familiar with them, try to do a lot of problems that involve them. The next questions are a little bit challenging. And if you're not familiar with how you should apply the theorems, it's going to take you some time during the exam. So it's really important that you are familiar with the questions, the kind of questions that that the questionnaire asks. So yeah, I hope you do well in the exam. And please comment down your questions and maybe suggestions for videos. And good luck. If you learned something new today, please help my channel by clicking the subscribe button and the bell for the notifications. See ya!